we're weak. And, and, and a lot of times, frankly, we try to mask that with, uh, with a self-confidence. Sometimes we try to mask our weakness uh, with a, a, a show of confidence that we don't really feel. Sometimes we mask it by, by achievement, Lord. But when it comes down to it, uh, we're weak. And, and it's right there. It's in those periods of weakness that, that we can experience you if we choose to, if we choose to be there and, and not mask it. And then turn to you and rely upon you and your people that, that we truly begin to see a little bit of your strength in our life where we begin to understand what Paul said when he asked you to remove this thorn in his flesh, whatever it was, and you, t and you turned him down, you said no, and you told him that my strength will be perfected in your weakness. And Lord, the, the first thing we want to do is flee from weakness. We want to run away from the times that we can't figure out. We want to run away from the times of pain. We want to run away from, from uh, the appearance of weakness in our life. And yet, that's when we truly learn that you are enough. And, and you begin to unmask all of the other things that we turn to. So Lord, we, we thank you for those times because we begin to see reality as you do it. And so we pray for Jeff, we pray for his family, we, we, we pray for Alan's family, for Beverly and, and Jesse and Selena, for those who have experienced loss. We pray for what's going on uh, on the East Coast right now with the tropical storm and those, who, those lives who have been lost, those who are facing displacement and everything else that comes from that. Lord, we, we're connected to these things. And so we pray, Lord Jesus, and we thank you that you're there. And while some may see things like that and say, how can a good God allow this kind of stuff to happen? We say, Lord, during times like this, you shine forth in the lives of your people in ways that are just not possible when everything is rosy and good. And so, Lord, we thank you that we walk by faith and not by sight. We thank you that we will understand and you will enlighten us when the time is right as to what all of this was about. But for now, we hold on to you because we're not strong. When we don't know what to do, Lord, you, you come through. And we thank you. And we pray these things this morning in your name. Amen. All right. We are in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we're going to be at verses 1 through 9 today. And I called this message, Where Things Are Headed. Frankly, it's a little bit misnamed because it could just as easily have been called the way things are now, the way things are now. Um, the reason for that is because it uses this term last days, and we'll get there when I get to the passage, but frankly, in the opinion of the New Testament, the New Testament writers, the last days began when Jesus came, died for our sins, rose, and went to be with his Father. The last days started, and we've been in them since then. So it seems like a long time to us, but not such a long time to God. We're in days that are called the last days. In the letter to Hebrews, the writer there begins with the assertion that God spoke of old to the fathers through the prophets, but in these last days has spoken to us through his Son. So when we, when we come to that, I don't want you just to think that this is something in the future. This is really something that we're experiencing right now in so many ways. So here's what this message is about today. I'm not going to read the whole passage first. We'll get there. But it's about this. Paul warns Timothy about the severe realities of serving Jesus in a world where people are opposed to... Sounds like a movie uh, a promo, right? In a world where... All right. In a world where people are opposed to God and truth and who use religion to mask ulterior motives. The, the, the worst... The worst oppressor is a religious oppressor, right? And unfortunately, it exists. All right, here's, here's the purpose. Here's what I'd like to accomplish today. To remind us that the climate for the gospel has always been difficult, but to encourage us that Jesus is always at work building his church. That's great encouragement. So here we go. Here we go. Point number one, before we even get to the passage. The reality we face. So there's your blank, reality if you're filling it in. The reality we face, difficult times. 
Actually, I think difficult times. So it's either difficult times or reality that you need. That's the blank there, so whatever applies. Here's, what Paul, here's how he starts out. But understand, and he's just been talking about false teachers and, and kind of the way we're supposed to be with one another at the end of chapter 2. But, so now he's shifting again, understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. All right, Paul says no or understand. We should be prepared for difficult times. In 1 Peter, Peter writes this in chapter 4, verses 12 through 13. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal or fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. The idea Peter brings into play, and he brings this over and over again in his epistles, that trials are a way of testing our faith, and frankly, a way for us to share in the sufferings of Jesus. And also, I might add, a way for us to show a world that doesn't know Jesus hope. When they see the hope that is within us, despite all of the stuff, then Peter says, be ready to make a defense in 1 Peter 3.15. It's in that, it's within the, the backdrop of suffering, in the backdrop of, of pain, in the backdrop of stuff we would consider, you know, we would consider negative. Stuff none of us want, but, but it's always there. Paul uses the word difficult, and he uses it in the future tense here. The idea is that as things progress in the last days towards the return of Christ, difficult times will come in varying degrees of, of intensity. And, and the word he uses is really interesting. It's the same word that Matthew uses in Matthew 8.28 where it's talking about two demon-possessed men. Jesus' disciples go to the east side of the Jordan River, the place called the Gadarenes, and there's two guys there, totally demon, totally taken over by demons. And Matthew says that these two guys were so fierce that no one could pass by. And that's the same word that Paul uses here. Fierce, difficult, troubling. It, it's not nice. That's what's going on. Difficult times will happen. So you put this together, Paul wants to stress to Timothy that this is normal. This is not abnormal. This is the way things are. Difficulty is to be expected. It is not going to be easy, and it's frankly not supposed to be easy to be a true follower of Jesus. It is within the difficult times when we find out if we have any faith or not. It tests our faith, according to Peter. When we lose all reason to worship God, we still worship him. C.S. Lewis said that Satan is never more defeated when a Christian who has been had every prop kicked out from underneath him or her and has come to the point where there's no reason to pray in terms of external you know, feedback. I'm not getting anything positive out of this. Nevertheless, kneels and prays. That is when Satan truly begins to flee. I can't stop this, is kind of what Satan begins to feel. And imagine that. We see this in the New Testament, in the Gospels. We see, we see what Jesus did. He was doing miracles, and he was, he, was, he was challenging the religious authorities. And so, under the power of Satan, we know that because uh, the, the Gospels say in, in John that Satan entered into Judas when he betrayed him. Satan was behind the scenes trying to make all of this happen. And, and he accomplishes it. Jesus is, is crucified. He's killed. It's not the end of the story, right? He rises. And they thought Jesus was trouble. And in Jerusalem, 40 days later, 12 guys just like him pop up doing the same stuff he did and making life miserable for the religious leaders. That, that is when our faith is tested, when we know that it's authentic. There were two influential books uh, within the last 30 years. One was called The Road Less Traveled by a guy named M. Scott Peck. This book begins with the words, life is hard. And then it continues on to talk about that, and, and Peck is a psychiatrist, or a psychologist, and what he is saying is this. 
The way to mental health, or at least one of the ways, is to embrace the fact that life is difficult. If you live your entire life thinking life should be easy, then you're always going to, to look for an easy path, and you will not become resilient and the kind of person who can work through the difficulty of life, which is always there. Your mental health, according to Peck, depends on it. And we're not talking about being a negative person. You're talking about just being a person who sees reality. And then a book most of you have read, or some of you have read, in about 2002, Rick Warren wrote The Purpose Driven Life, and he said this, it's not about you. That's the first words of the book. It's not about you. I had a guy come to my office one day after, the, after you know, we, we went through 40 Days Purpose, all of that, and he, he read the book, and he said, but I want it to be about me. I'm tired of it being about everybody else. <laughs> I am too. We all get there. I'm tired of it being about here. I want it to be about me for a little bit. And so what the point Warren is making is that your spiritual life is driven by a purpose of living in the New Testament mandates for a follower of Jesus, which quite often means it's not about you. It's about God and about what he's doing and your participation in it, which will not always be easy. In 1994, the Harvard Business Review reported that 60 to 90 percent of all doctor visits were due to stress-related illnesses. Now, you, 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 most of, and my wife has one. It's called myasthenia gravis. When we first found out about it, we said, "Well, what brings this on?" And he said, "Stress." I said, well, "How do we escape it then?" Everybody's got stress. I like to dive, I mean, not, you know, not just dive, but I like to put the scuba gear on and go down under the water. For me, it's fun. For some people, it's, oh my gosh, what's going on? For me, I just feel like I am breaking the laws of nature. I'm breathing underneath water. This is the coolest thing ever, and it feels like a whole new world is opening up to me, and, it, and it's really cool. Most of you have had the experience when you dive down and you, you hit about 8 to 10 feet, your head starts to hurt, right? You know why that is? <laughs> because we got air in our heads. <laughs> we are all airheads. And what's going on, what's going on is the pressure of the water is beginning to compress against those pockets in our head filled with air, like our sinuses and some of us our brains, you know. So, so it's starting to compress. So what you have to do in order for that pain to go away is do what you tell your kids not to do. Hold your nose and blow. That creates an equal pressure going out, and the headache goes away. And so you can go down pretty and you just continue to do that. Any diving class will tell you, if you haven't equalized, if you're, then stop the dive. The first time I ever went diving, I did not do this quite properly. And, and I, I didn't equalize until I got, you know, you're told to stop until you equalize. Well, I, okay, it's, it's, it's gone. I, I got down about 30 feet, and finally, equalized, but unfortunately, the pop was, was, was huge. And I had an earache and a headache for the next week because I didn't do it properly. So we have, we have pressure, and you, but you can dive, you know, by, with this process, about 200 feet. In the 1930s, an engineer by the name of Otis Barton developed a round submarine thing which was called a, a, a bathosphere. Bath, a bathos is, is Greek for deep, and a sphere, of course, is circular. So it, it was a, a, really a round submarine, only it was not powered. They had to drop it down with a cable. But it allowed, uh, at the time, it was pretty revolutionary. It allowed, die, you know, to go down about 3,000 feet. Guess what they found down there about 3,000 feet, and even deeper depths now? You know what they found? Fish. So the question is, well, if we have to have this, you know, two-inch thick steel thing to protect us when we go down there, how come the fish aren't blowing up all around us when they go down there? How do they, how do they, how do they survive under this kind of, of severe pressure? And the, the reason is because fish don't have air in their heads. <laughs> they, they got water, and, it's, and, and so they are continually exerting an equal pressure out because they're not having the air compressed. And so... Difficult times, lesson, class, <laughs> can be compensated by us having an internal device within us, always bringing out a, a, an equal and opposite pressure to the, to the pressure we're feeling inward. 
And we can do it one of two ways. We can either seal ourselves up in three inch thick shells, or we can invite the presence of Christ to exert pressure out so that we can still live in a world full of stress, full of pressure, and not blow up. So Paul told Timothy, and again, Timothy, in his early 30s, pastoring that church at Ephesus, Paul said, Timothy, I want you to know this, understand it, do not try to escape this, difficult times will come. You've already experienced them, and they're not going to stop. They're going to come in varying degrees of intensity until you die or until Jesus comes back. Just expect it. Because you're a Christian doesn't mean that everything's going to be... If you don't know that by now, then, you know, I guess you haven't experienced much. Most of you do. All right. Second point is this. The reason for the reality we face, difficult people, <laughs> of whom you are one of them, and so am I, all right? But here's what Paul writes. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth, just as Janus and Jambres or Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. Whoa! First, relax. I'm not going to go through all 19 attributes and, and unpack each one, all right? I'm not going to do that because many of you are probably, oh my gosh, he's going to look at every one of those words and we're going to find out more than we want to know about them. But there are 19 descriptions here, all right? Uh, there's various ways to categorize them. Perhaps the most helpful is that four of these 19 descriptions describe misplaced love. Misplaced love. The very first one, lovers of self. Um, and then you have proud, arrogant, abusive. Lovers of money. Lovers of pleasure, not lovers of God. In other words, what Paul is saying here is that part of the reason for this is that there is no love for God, there is love for self, and it results in all of this stuff. And frankly, the rest are, 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 are factors of broken relationships. So you look at this, disobedient in family life and more external life. Disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, which means without respect. Heartless or without natural affection is the way some translations put it. Unappeasable, <laughs> unwilling to negotiate. Um, slanderers, the word for slanderers is the word uh, diaboli. You know what word we get from that? Diabolical, which we also get the word devil. The devil, diablo. Okay? The slanderer, the liar. Speaking evil of others, especially behind their backs, without self-control or ungovernable. Man. Wow, Paul. You must have been reading the headlines. We are becoming more and more ungovernable. Brutal, fierce or untamed. Haters of good. Another way of categorizing these are, are the things that we are without, which are good things we should be with, and the things that we're, we are, we're running to, which are bad things we shouldn't be. And there's, there's two Greek terms to show the stuff that you have without. It's just a little word A. So we're without obedience to parents, without gratefulness, without holiness, uh, or respect, without love, without heart, without appeasement, so we're without all of that stuff, and the stuff we're running to is treachery and recklessness. So we have misplaced love, therefore we can't do the good stuff that we see probably should be done, and we're running towards everything that should not be run towards. So, when you put all this together, this is the human condition that Paul is describing. Uh, you have a picture of what it means to be self-centered rather than God-centered and others-centered. And this is the root of the times of stress that Paul is telling Timothy about. There's no respect or love for God or the things for God. And when you take that away, then you have love for self and everything that comes from it. In other words, in other words what you're saying it is it is about me and everybody else better know it's about me. 
the me monster. What's the comedian's name that does? I forget the guy's name. It's really funny, though. He talks about the me monster. You know, when you go to a party and you talk about the fact that you've had, uh, you just had two wisdom teeth removed. And he says, don't talk about having only two wisdom teeth removed because if you talk about having two wisdom teeth removed, the four wisdom teeth removed people are going to pounce on you and tell you about their experience having four wisdom teeth removed. It's about me, 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 right? And we've all been there, we've all done it, we all recognize it when it's happening, we just don't recognize it when we're doing it. Me monsters. And here's the truth. Here's the truth. Only the gospel offers a radical solution to this problem. This is the human condition, right? We all recognize it, we are all not at home with it, and yet we're all infected by it, and so we're forever looking for solutions from it. It's what, frankly, most of stuff is about. I, I feel this, I'm not at home with it, I, I have this sense of angst, what do I do with it? And people seek all kinds of solutions. By the way, this is what C.S. Lewis said, he became a believer in God rather than an atheist because he recognized this human condition and his thought was, well, I don't believe in God because everything is chaotic and none of this stuff makes sense, including my life. And then he thought deeper about it, and he said, well, wait a minute, if this is natural, if this is the way things are supposed to be, then who told me life doesn't make sense, and why am I striving for something that I can't seem to get? If I have a hunger for something, does that not presuppose that there's an answer out there to it? And he became a believer in God, and then ultimately a believer in Christ to solve the human condition in himself. The gospel is the only thing that offers that, and yet we go to all kinds, because, because it makes a new creation. We have a new birth. If you are in Christ, you are a new person. The Holy Spirit indwells you. Turn yourself from yourself to God. Another way to look at it is this. We are born bent, looking down this way. We can't look up no matter how hard we try. In fact, when we try, it's too painful. We don't want to look up. So all we can do is look down and kind of look around and make sure nobody's trying to hurt us. We're bent. The gospel straightens us. We're now able, our spirits are now alive, and we're able to, you know, to raise our arms and worship to the God who is there. So that's what Paul's talking about. And now here's, and he goes on. He goes on. He said, these people have a form of godliness, but deny its power. Now here's the shocker. These are religious people. And, not only are they religious people in the sense of paganism and all the stuff around them, these people were in the church at Ephesus making life difficult for Timothy. They're in the church. These people. Those people. Right? They're, they're here. They're among us. That's what Paul is saying. They were not out in the world so much, but but they're here. They were religious. Not only are they here, but they're acting religious. Right? It's a human, because religion is one of the things people turn to to answer the human condition. Well, it must be in religion, it must be in spirituality here. I'll go to this church or that church or the other church. I'll look for the answer by being religious. I'll make a deal with God. I do this, you got to do that which is religion. That's, again, why I'm no, despite what I do, I'm no fan of religion for religion's sake. Because religion for religion's sake has never been the answer to the human condition. Only the gospel is. All of our external forms, while they can be good if we have a heart that supports it, can also be extremely bad for our spiritual health. That's why you can go to a Christian college and be just as lost as if you didn't. You can go to a Christian school, be just as lost as if you didn't. Because the form, while it can be a good thing, can also be a bad thing because we're using it as a way to deceive ourselves and deceive others. So that's what Paul is saying. And this was true, this was true of Judaism of Paul's day. Paul was a Pharisee. He understood this better than most. If you want, it, just look at all the prophets and go to Isaiah chapter 1 where God is basically lambasting the leaders of, of Israel because he was saying, you're religious, but your religion has not touched your life. You, you don't really know God. You are... You're practicing, you're sacrificing, you're doing all this stuff, and then on the next day you're, you're mistreating widows and orphans. Your religion is a sham. 
I, in fact, Paul, or Isaiah writes, God speaking, I'm tired of it, I'm sick of it, it makes me want to puke. Excuse me. It's what God thinks of it. Also, Revelation. <laughs> you're, you're, you're lukewarm. Makes me want to throw up. It was true of paganism. It's true of institutional Christianity. I mean, how else do you explain the, the scandals that have happened in the church and go on and all the time? It's true of Islam. It's true of any religion. A practice of spirituality without the internal power of it. James says, he uses two things about the word religion. It, at James, when you, go, when you go to James' epistle, he, he says this, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. And by religion, he means the external practice, you know, the official, I'm going to church kind of thing. The very next verse, he says this, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. In other words, serve and don't buy into a system which is running very fast away from God. Or to put it another way, avoid hypocrisy and be involved in true service. Live for God rather than the world. The only way you can do that is through the power of the Holy Spirit we find in the New Testament. In our own day, I would label liberal religion is still seeking to worship, but they don't know who they're worshiping, and there's a complete denial of the power of the resurrection, for example. You go to some churches on Easter morning, and, and you have to do this with a British accent, I'm sorry. Well, yes, it's very good to have you here today, of course. When we talk about the resurrection of Jesus, we're talking about his spirit who lives in with all of us. Of course, there was no literal resurrection. That's disgusting. So there's a religious practice, but a total denial of the supernatural and anything that makes it powerful. Or as John Stott put it in his book on 2 Timothy, true religion combines form and power. In other words, you both go to church, but you truly believe it. It's not external without power, nor on the other hand does it emphasize moral power in such a way that it despises or dispenses with the proper external forms. Jesus criticized the Pharisees, right, and the religious practices of his day, but guess what? Jesus was still at the temple practicing Judaism. He still did the external forms. That he was pointing out the forms are not wrong. The forms are good and holy and just. But you've corrupted them by your practices. You've corrupted them by thinking that the form is what brings God pleasure and the form is only a response to the God to whom you need to bow and, for, and ask forgiveness. The forms are there to help remind you who you are and why we need God in our life. And so if you just go through the forms without the power, it's just dead religion. Later on in this chapter, Paul writes, while evil people and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. So it only gets worse. Have a nice day. All right, so what should Timothy do? What should he do? Simply put, Paul says, avoid them. Well, that doesn't seem very nice. Avoid them. Have nothing to do with them then. Is that nicer? These, now, please understand... These are people in the church making a sham and, frankly, giving the church a bad name out there, and, and, and Paul is telling Timothy, avoid them. Have nothing to do with them. Frankly, they're messing up your witness in the community because of that behavior. They're be avoid, they're to be avoided, even disciplined if it calls for it. If they make a profession of faith in Christ and then decide they can live as they please, they need to be shocked into a faith that truly pursues God. We can never be left with the feeling or with the understanding that as long as I go to church and I take communion, I do, I'm okay. That's a superstitious religious practice. That is doing stuff for the sake of twisting God's arm, saying, okay, now I did my part, now you've got to do yours. As if we deserve what we're about to receive, which is unmerited favor and grace. That's not the way it works. We do this stuff out of response and thankfulness, not to achieve anything, because we can't. I'm reading a book right now called The Way of the Dragon and the Way of the Lamb for the 
ethos project that Charles and I are involved in. It's by a guy named, uh, Jam, I guess it's pronounced Jamin, J-A-M-I-N, uh, Goggin, and Kyle Strobel. The basic premise of the book is that we Christians too often want to do the work of Jesus in a way that has more to do with the world and Satan than it has to do with Jesus. In other words, the way we serve, the way we obey, the way we do the things of Jesus are as important as what we do. Did you catch that? The way we do the things, quote, of God are as important as what we do, perhaps more important. What do I mean by that? Well, he says, and, and, and they're, they're very transparent in this, they say, we want worldly rather than spiritual power. You know, when I got invited to speak in Lodi, I felt good because, hey, man, I got noticed. Hey, somebody noticed me. I was, I was asked to speak. And, you know, that can kind of be, yeah, well, why shouldn't I be? I'm pretty good at this, you know. And it, I mean, this stuff can go to your head just as quick as that, and all of a sudden you find yourself doing things in a way of the dragon. Who's the dragon in the book of Revelation, by the way? Satan. Who's the lamb? The dragon is all about force, power, external coercion. The lamb got himself killed. Sacrificial. Looking very unpowerful. Looking very insignificant. And if we begin to embrace the way of the dragon, even the stuff we do for Jesus is corrupted through and through to the core. We, we idol worship in the church. We have, we have teachers. You know, that we're doing the same thing they did in Corinthians. Well, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow Peter. Well, we just follow Jesus. And we make a big deal out of it. As if, as if the, the individuals are more important than the message or the Bible. Now, that's not all. These leaders, these people who Paul says to Timothy to avoid, they practice deceptive tactics when it comes to recruiting people for their cause. <laughs> Look at verse 6. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. So what's going on here? It sounds like Paul's a chauvinist pig, doesn't it? Why weak women? Why not weak men? I'm sure they existed. Makes them sound like a woman hater or a disrespecter of women, but here's what's going on. Let's take a closer look. These teachers says they creep into households. Very much like, okay, the guy's gone to work, I'm going to... I'm going to go door to door now. So, so they're, creep, they're, they're trying to get a foothold into households, not in an upfront way, but they're worming, in other words, worming their way in. Their methods are deceptive. They creep, they sneak, or they smooth talk their way. Now this is why I deplore all means of evangelism that attempts to trick or manipulate people to get them to do what you want them to do. And folks, I, that frankly why I, you know, because I was kind of taught that somewhat in my church. Hey, try to trick people into getting the conversation about God rather than things just coming up on their own. You know what? That tells me that that means I can't trust Jesus to pull this thing off, so I'm going to have to manipulate my way into doing it. That's why I love Jay's stories, because he's not trying to manipulate anybody. It's just this stuff comes out in natural conversation, and then the door opens up. People truly are in need, and they understand it. Man, when the door opens up, you don't have to manipulate them. They're there. And, and, and a, a way for the gospel opens up. Rather, we should speak directly and clearly in a straightforward way. And then it says, says, they capture, they capture these women. They're not seeking the interest of the one they evangelize. They're seeking their own interest. They are not setting people free. They're capturing people. Who are they targeting? Not the husbands, which would have been the proper way, especially in that culture, to target. They're, they're swooping in when the husband's gone. And, and, and they're actually looking for a certain type of, of wife here, of woman. The Greek term 
is gunakaira, and it means literally little women. Louisa May Alcott got that and decided she'd write a book about it called Little Women. Not really. It's a totally different idea. Paul's quoting a popular term of the day that described women who were, in a sense, kind of silly and weak. He's not saying all women were like this, but he said they were around in Ephesus, and that's the kind that these guys are going in when the husband's gone, and they start, they start their smooth talk. Hey, you know what? You know, the church is telling you that Jesus came physically, and he died physically and rose physically. You know, that, that's, that's goofy. We know. We have a higher knowledge. We know that God is not really concerned with the physical. He's only concerned with the spiritual. And they're getting a captive audience. Oh, yeah, well, that makes sense. And, 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 and it begins to poison the whole household because truth or, or false, falsity is deceptive. And it's also sometimes there's, there's, a, there's a sense, there, there's a ring of, oh, yeah, that makes sense. It's not total nonsense. It's just a little bit of nonsense. Then it becomes total nonsense. So they were, and these women, they were morally weak. They were burdened with sins and led astray by various passions. It could be these, they, they had a little reputation. These guys knew about it. And so they would take advantage of this, most likely telling them that, you know what, because God is concerned with spirit, you know that little that thing you're, you're doing? It's no big deal. Oh, God, thank you. Man, I was, whew. How different from Jesus when he went to the woman at the well and, and he, you know, he talked about her husband and she said, I don't have a husband. And he said, that's true, you don't have a husband. You've had five and the one you're living with is not your husband. In other words, kind of a tongue-in-cheek, you may be immoral, but at least you're telling the truth. But he went at it a little more directly than these guys. These women are also intellectually weak. They were unstable and gullible. They were ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They knew a lot, but they were unable to make conclusions about anything, pretty much like our intelligentsia of the day. A lot of great ideas out there, but you never really have to commit to anything because it's just all theoretical knowledge anyway. In our own day, it's the emphasis that the, the search for truth is important, but we know you're never going to find it. So the search is gallant. Just continue the search. And nobody seems to think to stop and ask, well, if there's no truth out there, why search for it? If you're searching, doesn't that mean you're trying to find something real? Why is the journey so important if it's leading nowhere? That kind of a journey, maybe the best thing to do is turn around and go to something that's real. But, but we're never asking that, and we're not even allowed to. In his, in his book, The Divine Conspiracy, Dallas Willard tells of an incident of a young woman at Yale who was in an ethics class, and she was being frankly harassed by a young man in the same ethics class for sex that she did not want to give to him, but he kept harassing her, and he was getting an A in his ethics class. In other words, it's possible to get an A in the ethics class and be totally unethical. And there were no terms in which to tell this young man, what you're doing is wrong. Luke puts it this way when Paul's in Athens. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. In other words, if it's new, it's good. If it's old, it's bad. So let's hear the new stuff. The woman at the well with Jesus kind of deflected and tried to divide. She said, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews say that Jerusalem is the place where you ought to worship. Jesus replied, you worship what you don't know. <laughs> But the hour is coming when neither on this mountain, Gerizim, or in Jerusalem, true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Well, we're looking for the Messiah. I'm him. And then she went and told everybody. He dealt directly with her. Paul then compares these false teachers in, with two guys named Janus and Jambres from Exodus chapter 11. This is when Moses came before Pharaoh, did all the cool stuff with the staff. And then these guys came in. They weren't named in Exodus. They were named by Jewish tradition. And so Paul is using those names here. So the, the Pharaoh's guys come in. They do the same tricks. And it looked like, well, there's a standoff here until what? Moses' snake ate up the one with, you know, well, Moses won. God won. And Paul is saying these guys, they're like them. 
They're like them. Avoid them. Have nothing to do. Application. What are you falling for? Are, are you falling for stuff that really has nothing to do with the truth today? I think there are two categories Christians get caught, and I'm going to be real quick here, but, I, but you need to hear this. Two categories that we get caught. One is where we emphasize grace to the exclusion of truth, and the other is when we, when we emphasize truth to the exclusion of grace. Jesus was full of grace and truth. So the emphasis of grace says our behavior doesn't matter. Just my, my attitude, my, you know, it doesn't matter if I truly follow Jesus in practical ways, just, just so that my, my head's in the right place. Well, if, it's not what the New Testament says about it. Your behavior does matter. Those who follow Christ should be doing it. So, so grace and truth come along, and frankly, it's not like they balance each other out. They are, in the end, the same thing. And so if you pursue truth without grace, you're not really going after truth. And if you pursue grace without truth, you're not really going after grace. They're the same coin. They go together. If you try to divide them, you got something else. It's amazing how much... So if you, if you, if you pursue truth and not grace, you become legalistic. You become the type of person that tells everybody else. You become the type of person with the log in your eye. You become all of that. Grace without truth, you don't really believe anything. All right. Looks bad, right? <laughs> it looks bad. In the last days, it's going to be difficult. Why? Because there's difficult people. Looks bad. But then comes a note of encouragement, the encouraging promise. Verse 9. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. Okay, Janus and Jambres had to watch their staff get eaten up by Moses' staff. Had to come as a shock to them. God, in the end, is in charge. Paul says, these guys aren't going to get very far. Well, it looks like they're getting far. Paul says, no, they're not getting far. Why not? Well, let me again remind you. Somehow the church and the gospel have survived for 2,018 years, roughly. The truth... And the grace of Jesus has survived despite what we and other people tried to do to it down through the centuries. Why? Why has it survived? Because Matthew 16, 18 through 19, Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, you are Peter, you're a rock. But on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevent, prevail against it. That's why. Because Jesus is building his church. And Jesus will continue to build his church. And you and I get to be a part of Jesus building his church. But if we forget that Jesus is building the church, we're going to try to build it and we're going to fall into stuff that we're not acting properly. We begin to think we are doing it, we can do it, our techniques, all of our genius will win people over. One, guy, one, one author of that book said, I have a sneaking suspicion I could be an atheist and be a successful pastor. You know why that is? Because most of the time our techniques don't involve God at all, don't involve prayer, don't involve anything that has to do with the Holy Spirit. We can make it happen. God, stand back, watch us. We're pretty good at this. And we do seminars and write books and on and on. And I'm not denouncing that. So I, I, I participate in them. But I'm telling you, it is subtle, and man, can we get caught up in it fast. I got invited to speak. I must be pretty good. Hey, this is cool. Somebody likes me. Nobody at church does, so I'll go to Lodi where everybody likes me. Because <laughs> they don't know me, right? So we kind of go, oh, well, that's it. All right, here's the thing. Chris, come on up. We're going to close this. Next step. This week, and, and here's how, this week, take a break from immersing yourself in media, whether it's Christian or otherwise, where you are getting a steady diet of bad news. Take the time instead to see places where you see Jesus building his church. Now, oh, Jesus is there, man. Huh? And then put your efforts there. 
You know, don't try to start anything yourself. Look where Jesus is. Put your efforts there. Begin to see what God will do through you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Help us not to be the type of people Paul described, and we confess to you that we are sometimes because the human condition has infected us. We thank you that we, it is now possible for us to be God-centered, to be looking to you, to have our spirits brought alive by you. You've already done that. Help us to know who we are as sons and daughters of the living God. And in everything we do, act like it. We pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen.